Hello, and welcome to Game Gems. Today, we're going to look at another application of the concept spelled out in my previous video on scene trees as data, using a tile map to generate a 3D done. What do you mean it's already been done? One moment. One of the great, and often difficult for newcomers to grasp, things about software development is that there are often multiple solutions to any given problem. As a result of this, Newbies, who rightfully ask, what's the best way to do X, will often get the very unhelpful response, it depends. For example, I'm not the first person to cover this topic, so I'll link the previous video in the description below. Study both implementations and decide which one makes the most sense to you if you wish to add this feature to your own projects. Exploring different algorithms will make you a better problem solver in the long run, and that's what matters the most. So let's get started. As previously stated, today we're going to look at a way to generate a three-dimensional dungeon from a tile map node in Godot. The most obvious advantage to doing it this way is that it allows you to leverage Godot's editor and interface to design something with a few mouse clicks that would otherwise require an external tool and possibly a custom file format with a parser to boot. As we've discussed prior, scene files are literally just resources to Godot, and resources are for storing data, which makes them ideal to use as a flexible file format for all of our needs. It's how you choose to interpret and render that data that makes them powerful. Before we do though, I recommend you watch my video on random dungeon generation as we'll be both modifying and integrating that generator into this project. Here's the app that we'll be building. As you can see, it's a three-dimensional dungeon with grid-based movement in the style of the classic RPGs like Wizardry or the Bard's Tale. Of course, those games didn't use a fully 3D environment to render the mazes like we're going to, but technology advances for a reason. Anyway, pressing the M key brings up the overhead map, and if you check the random property of the maze object, the maze will be randomly generated. The base tree is just a single node 3D to hold our maze and our player, as well as a world environment so we can have lighting. Our player is also a node 3D with a camera attached. We could have just used the camera node as our player, but there's a lot of enhancements that we can make to our game later on that would make that method unworkable really fast. You'll notice that I have a script attached to the player node, but it turned out to be unnecessary in the long run. All I did was get a reference to the camera node, which I never actually use. Oh well, don't worry about it. The maze object is where most of the magic happens. It's a node that holds both the overhead map and the 3D environment, and is also responsible for generating a random map and building the 3D maze once the map has been created. Let's see how it's done. The first thing we do is define an enum with some tile indices to make our lives easier. This is actually a little redundant since we already defined two of these values in the map generator but I didn't want to modify that code too much and we'll need a third value anyway, so whatever. That third value is explicitly set to negative one to indicate that the tile we're trying to access is actually outside of the map. To be honest, for this app specifically, the only value we actually care about is the one denoting an empty space, but it's always good to have slightly more verbose data than you need in the event that you'll be expanding it later. Next, we have a couple of exportable variables. The block prefab is the scene that we'll be using to build our maze, and we'll look at how it was created in a moment. We also have a scene for our tile map. This is because it's easier to just load and instantiate a pre-generated tile map with a tile set and such already defined rather than having to initialize all of that data manually, even if we will potentially erase it later. Plus, prior to getting the maze generation working, I was using a pre-built map to make testing easier. One thing at a time, after all. And last but not least, I drag our old friend icon.svg to use as a positional marker on our overhead map, because it's not actually a real Godot project unless the logo shows up somewhere. You know it's true. Finally, I export a vector indicating the size of any random maps we create, and a Boolean variable to indicate whether or not to use the pre-generated map or clear it out and start anew. The last couple of variables are used to hold references to the overhead map, the map marker and a vector that will be used to define the player's start position on a random map, because we can't guarantee that the square we defined elsewhere in the app won't be invalid. In my ready function, I initialize the maze object. First, I manually create a new Sprite2D and set its data values so that it'll make a suitable map marker. Then, I load the tile map defined in my exported variable. Again, you need to provide a tile map for Godot to work with, even if you plan on randomly generating your maze, so remember to create one and drag it into the correct slot. Next, we check if the random box has been checked. If it has, we generate a new dungeon. You'll notice I made a slight modification to the dungeon generator autoload so that it returns a player start position defined as a vector2i. We'll take a look how that was done in a moment. Then, once we have a tile map, we'll feed it into the map builder 3D, which is also an autoload, along with a reference to the map object itself and the map block we'll be using for the maze. As an aside, the reason we're defining the map block here instead of directly within the map builder is because we may want to modify it beforehand 
like set up new materials or textures prior to passing it to the builder. It's also just good practice to let Godot handle resource loading with exportable variables wherever possible, rather than do it yourself in code. Saves time. Once we have a 3D map built, we attach the tile map to the maze, attach the marker to the map, and then hide the map so that it's invisible until the player presses M. The maze needs two more methods before it's ready to roll. One to get the cell data of the tile map, and one to update the marker position when the player moves. Since we're only using a two-tile tile set, we can just use the x-coordinate of the tile's atlas position as our tile index, which maps to the enum we defined earlier. Also, since the player marker is a sprite, we need to multiply the desired tile location by the size of the tile in pixels, in this case 16, to make sure it's in the right spot. In most cases, we can use the tile map's built-in methods to get these pixel coordinates, but it never hurts to practice the math yourself so that you know what they're doing. Before we take a deep dive into the map builder though, let's look at how we use the tile map to move our player through 3D space. In our world node, the first thing we do is initialize the player's position within the maze. We do this either with the exportable variable defined at the top of the script, or we get the value generated as part of the map building process. Again, we check the map's random property to know which of these values to use. Then, we define our input handling routine. Since we're not doing real-time key polling for an action game, it's totally fine to just wait for the user to press a key and then react to it. We do this with the unhandled key input method, and we use that one instead of the regular input method, because in larger projects, user interfaces may have hotkeys or other commands that would handle the key input and take priority over player movement, so it's a good habit to get into. Within this method, we check the Godot input singleton, and to keep things simple, we're just using the arrow keys to either move forward or turn our player left or right. Since by default the arrow keys are mapped to the UI left, UI up, and UI right directions, we can check if they've been pressed here. However, we only want the player to make a single move or rotation when the key is pressed, so we use action just pressed instead of the more common action pressed. This will only fire during the frame the key has been held down. And before we look at player movement, note that we've added a custom action to our input map called map and assigned it to the M key. So here we check for it and toggle the map visibility, as well as make sure the marker's position has been updated. There are three methods involved in player movement. First, a method to set the player's position. Since, as we have not actually seen yet, all of the blocks in the maze are a single world unit in size and offset such that the center point of the block is in the center of the cube that represents that bit of world space, we can simply assign the origin of the player's transform to the cell coordinates, making sure to swap the Y for the world Z coordinate, since in 3D space the horizontal plane of movement is defined by the XZ coordinates, not XY. The reason we do this manually instead of using the position property is because it bypasses all of the other calculations Godot makes under the hood, guaranteeing us that our player is where it needs to be. This also allows us to use a clever trick for movement, which we'll see in a moment. Anyway, uh, next up we have our method to rotate the camera. We can simply increment or decrement the rotation degrees property rather than having to screw around with radians. The one thing we need to do though, or rather we technically don't, but I do it anyway for clarity's sake, is to lock the rotation between 0 and 360. It doesn't affect the actual rotation of the object if we don't, I just don't like having to mentally convert values outside of that range when debugging. Finally, the clever bit, moving a player forward. This is where we learn about a sneaky little object within the transform known as the basis. Your object's basis is a normalized, that is all the values are between zero and one, set of vectors that hold all the positional information of the object's current orientation. And the Z component of this matrix holds the facing of our player. This means that if the object is facing left, the value that represents the object's x-coordinate is negative 1. If the object is facing right, that coordinate is 1. And if the object is facing forward, the x-coordinates are both 0, but the z-coordinate is 1. This is how we can determine where to move our player without requiring any conditional checks or fancy math. Just subtract the z-component of your player's transform basis from the origin vector, and you magically have the square that the player will move to if you press the forward key. Once you've got that destination square, round its values so that they're clamped to whole numbers. World space coordinates are floats, and they tend to drift over time if you don't, because float calculations are imprecise in tiny ways that build up over time. And once you have that destination square's coordinates, you can simply check your map via the getTileData method we defined before. If the return value is an empty tile, set the player's position to the intended destination and update the marker. Voila! Five lines of code for perfect grid-based movement. You can't beat that with a stick. And if you don't want instantaneous movement, just tween between the two positions instead of directly assigning the new value, and block input while the tween is in effect. Okay, now let's look at the 3D Maze Builder. The Maze Builder does its thing in its generate method, and it requires three parameters. The tile map it will be reading data from, the node that will hold the 3D Maze blocks once they've been initialized, 
and the block prefab that it will use as the building block, pun intended, of the maze. The first thing the generate method does is delete all of the children of the containing node. This wipes out any previous map data so that we can start fresh. Then it uses the tile map to initialize an array of data that it will use to build the map, and finally it will construct the map and attach it to the container node. The init map data method parses the tile map and constructs a two dimensional array of the tile indices. As mentioned in my previous video on random dungeon generation, in Godot 4, the tile indices are represented by two dimensional vectors, but since our tile map only contains two tiles, we don't actually care about the y value. The x value is essentially the tile index. The first thing we do is define a couple of loop variables and using a nested loop, count the number of tiles in our tile map in the x and y directions. We start at zero and keep looping as long as the atlas coordinates that come back don't equal negative one, which indicates an unused tile. Once that happens, we fall through the loops and assign the final values of x and y to the width and height parameters and resize our tile and block data arrays to match the height of the map. Note that the main reason that this all works is because we are using black tiles with an index of zero to indicate empty spaces rather than just simply not assigning any tiles at all. This helps us get our calculations correct. We also echo the values we just parsed to verify that our routine worked properly because we're thorough and we hate rude surprises. Next, we initialize the second dimension of our arrays. GDScript doesn't have native support for multi-dimensional arrays, so we have to do it manually. Loop through the tile and block arrays and assign a new empty array to each element, then resize it to the width of the array. Finally, another nested loop gives us all of the tile data, which as previously stated, is just the X value of the atlas coordinate. It is definitely possible to combine these two loops so that you don't have to traverse the map twice, but I like my code to be readable and straightforward. And as I've said in the past, first make it work, then make it clever. And I don't feel like making this clever. Let's move on. We define a helper method to get the tile data given the requisite row and column, which is basically the same thing as we did for the map object itself, except that it's operating on a different array. It's kind of unavoidable given our desire for encapsulation. After we have the tile data, we can build the map. Before we do though, let's take a quick look at how the block prefab is constructed. The block prefab is a single node 3D that contains a collection of mesh instance 3Ds representing the six faces of the cube. Each mesh is rotated such that it's facing inward and is positioned a half unit from the center of the node. This means that the cube itself measures one world unit across on all sides and can be intuitively positioned in world space representing our tile grid by using the tile coordinates as world coordinates. And although we're referring to them as blocks, since all of the walls face inwards, we're actually placing small rooms. In order to build our maze, we need to place our new block into the world and then check all of the adjacent blocks in the cardinal compass directions. If there is a pre-existing block in that direction, we remove the walls of each block in that direction, which then connect the blocks into one larger block. Note that this method produces a bunch of individual mesh nodes, and although it's fairly simple to implement, it probably won't be good for larger Minecraft-style worlds. In that case, you'd want to build a singular mesh to represent the entire visible terrain, but that is way beyond the scope of this tutorial. If you'd like to see a video on it in the future, let me know in the comments. Anyway, back to the maze. To build the maze, we again use a nested loop with the boundaries ranging from zero to the dimensions of the map in both directions, and then we check the tile data at the relevant indices to indicate if it's open space. If it is, we want to place a block, which again, actually represents an open space in that position. So we call our construct block method to initialize a new block, set its position equal to the grid coordinates, add the block to our list of blocks, and then add the block to our container node so that it shows up in game. And why do we use an array for the blocks? We do that because since it's a two dimensional array, it allows us to access the block at a specific set of coordinates easier than it would be to try and get the block as a child of the container, which is a one dimensional array and requires a bit of extra math that we're too lazy to do. So what does construct block do? The construct block method is the function that checks all adjacent grid positions and removes the walls that touch one another. There's probably a more elegant way to do this than the brute force method I'm about to show you, but again, it works and I don't feel like being clever. The dirty secret of computer programming is that you often don't have to be clever unless you're writing a routine that needs to be extended or otherwise modified in the future, and this is not one of those routines. In fact, the map generation is only going to be run once, so you don't even really have to worry about optimization unless it's clearly taking way too long. With that out of the way, let's look at construct block. The first thing we do is instantiate a new copy of our block prefab and define a pair of variables to hold the adjacent block and the wall we're about to delete. Technically, you don't need a variable for the wall. We'll see why in a moment. We don't actually want to check outside the bounds of the map. So if the block we're about to place is either in row or column zero, we don't bother checking for adjacent blocks. 
they'll be connected by the blocks placed next to them, if any. Then we see if there's already a block in our blocks array at the indicated coordinates, east and west when we're checking columns, or north and south when we're checking rows. If there is, we attempt to get a reference to the relevant child node of the adjacent block. For example, if the block adjacent to our newly spawned block is to the north, then we need to remove our new block's north wall as well as the adjacent block's south wall. Here I perform a little extra error checking to make sure that the walls exist and have been successfully accessed before I delete them. In hindsight, I can't think of any reason why they wouldn't, so you can probably ignore this bit. Repeat this process in the other direction, and then return to the new block so that the build map method can add it to the world space. Finally, let's pop back into the dungeon generator. Just after the point where you've dug all of your rooms, assign the center point of the first room in the array to the player's start location and return that vector at the end of the method. And that's it! There are a lot of ways to turn this app skeleton into a full-blown dungeon crawler. Try adding textures and proper lighting to the map so that it's not being weirdly lit by a skybox that you'd ever actually see, or maybe just add the ability to cast Magic Missile and attack the darkness. Once you've put on your robe and wizard hat, smash the like button and subscribe to this channel for more game gems, and buy me a coffee at the link below. You know you want to. See you next time.